Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to this program and to the beautiful city of Pisa, uh, whose uh, main attraction, I think, uh, is uh, a positive message for us mathematicians, so something that we might not be very proud of or very happy how it turned out today, it could be what makes us famous several hundred years from now. So you never know what could be good or not. So I'm going to talk to you about the Yokonoma Heike Algebra of Type A, uh, uh, which falls under the title of this workshop, uh, because Yokonoma Heike Algebras were introduced by Yokonoma as generalizations of Ivahori Heike Algebras. So an Ivahori Heike Algebra uh, can be seen as an endomorphism ring of, uh, like in the context of Chevalet groups, so final Chevalet groups, uh, as a dome of rings of the permutation representation with respect to a Borel subgroup. So what Yokonoma did was he replaced the Borel subgroup by any maximal unipotent subgroup. So what we, he obtained was a generalized Ivahori Heike algebra that we call Yokonoma Heike algebra. Uh, however, I uh, discovered these uh, algebras a couple of years ago uh, from topologists who are using these Yokonoma Heike algebras to obtain invariance for knots. And since this was the way I was introduced to these algebras, this is the way I'm going to introduce you to these algebras. So I'm going to start with uh, the brain group of type A. So Bn is uh, generated by n minus 1 generators that satisfy the usual break relations that you see here. Each element of the n can be seen, uh, that can be represented by a diagram of n dots at the top and n dots at the bottom, where uh, each dot at the uh, top is connected with exactly one dot at the bottom. And we keep track of uh, the way the strands cross with each other. So the identity braid is the one where you connect the first dot with the first dot, the second dot with the second dot, and so on. And the generators sigma i are the ones that correspond to permutation of i, i plus 1. Again, remember the crossing is important. If you cross the other way around, you obtain the inverse of the generator sigma i. And then the multiplication is given by concatenation of diagrams. So you see here, for example, the multiplication of the elements alpha, beta. Why do we look uh, at brain groups when we want, are interested in knots? So very quickly, I say that a knot is an embedding of a circle in the three-dimensional space. A link is uh, an embedding of several copies of circles into the three-dimensional space. So here I give an example of a knot, the trefoil knot, and a link, uh, the Boronian rings. And because we're mathematicians and we like to work on paper, uh, each link or knot can be represented by a diagram which is just projecting the knot uh, onto the two-dimensional uh, space, and we keep track of the crossings again. So now every element of the brain group can give rise to a knot or link. And the way we do that is that we take our diagram for the braid and then we connect the first dot at the top with the first dot at the bottom, the second dot with the second dot, and so on until we reach the nth knot. And what we get like that is the closure of the braid alpha, and this is in fact the diagram of a knot or a link. Uh, for example, I give here when you close the identity braid, you obtain the circle, or else called the knot. If you take sigma 1, the generator, and you close it, you obtain this diagram, sigma 1 square, and sigma 1 cube, I don't write it, but it's actually, it's going to be the trifold knot we saw uh, in the previous slide. So the major question in knot theory is when two knots or links are equivalent, which means when, um, like mathematically means when there is an isotopy between the two objects, uh, not mathematically speaking, is like imagine that you're, like we are always in the three-dimensional space, don't forget that. Imagine that everything is in a fluid and you can move gently around strands to go from one knot to the other, you cannot break things apart. 
So for example, the node that we obtained from sigma 1 is this one. I like my name. And then we can see we can move this thing to obtain the node. And actually, sigma 1 gives rise to the node, uh, while sigma 1 <coughs> square is two uh, circles linked to each other in a way that we cannot break them. Um, so why do, uh, how do bridge connect with nodes? We saw that every element of Vn gives rise to a node, but also we have the converse, so it's every node and link can be represented by a bridge. So it, it, is, uh, it arises as the closure of a bridge. And then we define an equivalence relation on the braid groups in the following way. So we say that each braid is equivalent to uh, so we take the transitive closure of the following two movements. Uh, each braid is equivalent to its conjugate, so alpha beta is, is equivalent to beta alpha, and also uh, alpha in Bn is equivalent to alpha sigma n that now lives in Bn plus 1, and to alpha sigma n minus 1. And Markov's theorem says that we have that two uh, nodes or links uh, that are the closures of braids alpha and beta are equivalent if and only if the braids alpha and beta are equivalent uh, by the equivalence relation that described here that is we can move we can go from alpha to beta by moves of that type like conjugation or Markov's moves and here well I uh, draw the diagrams of this kind of moves but for example you can see the second one uh, if you have your braid alpha and the node, remember we are in the three-dimensional space, and we add an extra strand, and then we do a small twist, that's the sigma n right there. In the three-dimensional space, we can always untwist <coughs> the, the last uh, permutation and obtain back alpha. So these are quite, quite natural as moves. The if and only if is the most difficult part. <coughs> And this is where the uh, notion of not invariant comes handy. Uh, so a not invariant is a function from the set of links or nodes to a set. The set could be a set of numbers, a set of colors, a set of polynomials, a set of apples. I don't know, but anything such that if two nodes or links are equivalent, then the function takes the same value on them. So a not invariant cannot determine whether two nodes are equivalent, but it can determine whether they are not equivalent. So it's just like we take two nodes, we apply the function. If the function doesn't give the same value, you know that you didn't start with equivalent nodes. So that's, the, that's what we're looking for in node theory, like we're looking for good not invariants that can distinguish <coughs> the maximum number of nodes possible. If we translate that to braids because of Markov's theorem, uh, the definition of not invariant can become as follows. It's a function on the union of braid groups such that uh, uh, the function i takes the same values on alpha, beta, and beta alpha, so it's stable under conjugation. And also you have that the value alpha is the same on alpha sigma n, the same on alpha sigma n minus 1. So you know that if you have a function that satisfies the properties 1 and 2, then you have a not invariant. And at, uh, please pay attention that the yes. first condition, sorry? Do you need uh, the fact that this function is matches on Bn and Bn plus 1? Hmm? Does it need to match on Bn and Bn plus 1? Uh, so is it just joint union or just increase? <coughs> It's joint. Uh, it's, uh, you, yeah, you see every knot in the smallest possible, so you can see that it's uh, disjoint. But um, yeah, it's disjoint because like to s the identity, um, if you are in B2 and you take the identity and you close it, then you have two circles, which is not the same as one circle. So <coughs> you, okay, yeah, you see it like that. So you would like that it separates these two identity from identity. And in this talk, uh, S will be a set of polynomials. You see, how. Huh. So I will start with the Vahori Hecke algebra of type A, and then I will move to the Yokonuma Hecke algebra. So I have
have an indeterminate q, I take r to be uh, a Lorentz polynomial ring with coefficients in c. Then my Vahorn-Heike algebra of type A is generated by n minus 1 elements that satisfy the, the same braid relations as before, like sigma i did. Only now I have an extra relation for the generators, this quadratic relation that um, uses, uh, that involves the parameter q. So this algebra is obviously a quotient of the group algebra of the braid group over the quadratic relation, so we have the same relations, we wash it over the quadratic and we obtain the ivarhol hecke algebra. And also we see <coughs> that if we take q to be equal to 1, then the generators become of order 2 and what we get is a presentation of the symmetric group. So we get the group algebra of the symmetric group over c. So the ivarhol hecke algebra is a deformation of the group algebra of the symmetric group. Now, uh, by Jones, we have this is like I'm saying it, I'm not going to give a definition. We have a Markov trace, so this is a trace function on the Hecke algebra uh, with values in the ring R. This trace is called the Ocneano trace and it's unique depending on the parameter zeta. So the way the Markov trace is defined is uh, you actually have a collection of traces for every n. So, uh, you have on Hn, on Hn plus 1. So, actually, when I write here Markov trace to, I mean that the collection of traces on each algebra. But I'm saying that very vaguely. So, I want you to remember now that I said that having a trace property is very good for an invariant. That's like the first uh, step check. So, and because the braid group can be seen inside the group algebra of the braid group, and then we can quash it <coughs> to the Hecke algebra by sending its sigma i to the generator gi, and then use the trace to go further to r. What we get by this composition is a function that takes the same values on alpha, beta, and beta alpha. So, your parameter z. My parameter z, it's, it's uh, actually, uh, what happens is that it's the value of the GIs, is the trace of the GIs, and then the Markov uh, trace is that the trace of alpha uh, times GN is zeta times right, uh, trace of alpha. So actually you don't have the same, the second condition, you need for an invariant, that's what I want to say, you don't have the second condition, you don't have that the trace of alpha is equal to the trace of alpha gn, which would be the best thing to have an invariant. There is the zeta intervening, but then you do, you can change, like you can add the coefficient in front of the trace, and what we say is that we normalize the trace so that the second condition will also hold, and we obtain an invariant which is known as the Homfield polynomial or two-variable Jones polynomial because the two variables are zeta and q. My question was, is he in the parameter really in which set? Uh, you can take z to be just a complex number, you could have it in r. So it's uh, in r, the way I define it, but most usually we just take a complex number. And in order to define the not invariant, you need z to be different than zero. You define for every other value. And this is the way we obtain a not invariant starting with the eva hori hecke so now I'm going to talk to you about framed knots and links. And for this, I'm going to introduce the framed braid group, which is simply um, the reed product of uh, a cyclic group, let's say of order D, with a braid group. So reed product, whenever I talk about reed products in this talk, I mean semi direct product of n copies of the cyclic group with the n. And the multiplication, the semi-direct product structure is given on the slide. So you have generators of the braid group, sigma 1 to sigma n minus 1. You have the generators t1 to tn that are each of them a generator of a cycle group. They commute with each other. And then every time a tj is multiplied with the generator sigma i, it passes through with a change of index uh, so we apply, by applying the permutation i i plus one to the index. So this is the semi-direct product uh, structure, or the real product structure, I'm going to call it. 
Again, we have diagrams representing the elements of the frame break group. So because of the last relation in the uh, definition of the group, whenever I have a word there, it has TIs and sigma i's. But I can always move the TIs uh, through the sigma i's and obtain all the TIs in front and all the sigma uh, i's on the right hand side. And then all the sigma i's will give me an element of the classical brain group, which has a diagram. This is exactly the same diagram that we have here. So the TIs correspond to weights attached to the struts, like attached to the brains. Mm -hmm. And the way the thing works is that the power of TI gives us the weight attached to the ith strut. So the, way, the power of T1 is the weight to the first strut. The power of T2 is uh, the weight to the second strut. And this is a number from 0 to D minus 1. Uh, I give here the example of the identity break multiplied by t1 to the a, t2 to the b, is just, again, the identity break with weight, or framing, we call it, that's why frame break group, a of the first strand and b of the second strand. Then, with sigma 1, again, you see I have the weights a and b, and sigma 1 squared. I consider the, whole, the weight goes down the whole uh, strand. And the multiplication is given again by concatenation of diagrams, which works very well by adding the uh, framings corresponding to the strands that get attached. So I didn't have much space here, but if you take the second one, T1 to the A, T2 to the B sigma 1, and you multiply it with the identity one, but with A prime, B prime, <coughs> then either by using the formulas or by using the concatenation of diagrams, you end up with sigma 1, where the weight on the first strand is A plus B prime, and on the second strand is B plus A prime. So either using the formulas or the diagrams, you, everything is well and nicely defined. Then every element of this group gives rise down to a frame, not or link, which is just a regular not only with weights attached to each component. Uh, I give here some examples we saw before. So we have the closure works exactly the same way. First dot to first dot, second dot to second dot. We take the closure and the weight is the sum of the weights um, appearing in the components forming the link. So in the first case where we just get the anot, we get the anot with a weight A plus B. In the second case, where we do have two separate components, even though they are linked in the middle, we have each component has its own weight, A and B. And when now we talk about equivalence of frame nodes, we want the diagrams to be equivalent, we want the class, the underlying node or link to be equivalent, but we also want to have the same weights. Yeah. So this is not the usual definition of frame nodes where you have a... So actually, yeah, we, I was having, even though the topologies, I was having a discussion. There is, they, apparently they do correspond to the same thing. It's diagrammatic approach, the curve, like... So I mean, if you get, if you do a framing in your braid and you close it, or if you take the braid without framing, do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know that there is another definition of frame nodes, but, well, as... I, I just asked the apologists and they told me they actually correspond to the same thing. Okay. It's uh, that the other approach of, like, Jordi had asked me this question in September, I still remember that, that it, it's, uh, it looks like it's, for me, it looks like it's not. So you have these movements and you consider that you just attach weights and everything else remains the same as before, the equivalence. But there is the one where you go plus one every time you have um, yes. a twist, but apparently, at least they told me that this is the same thing. There are two approaches for the same thing. The other one is more diagrammatic, and the weights correspond to other things. I don't know how okay. it works and how, like, because I have not checked it myself. But they told me they do correspond on the same thing. It's that two approaches on the same thing, and then there are the Reitermeister moves, and the one is res here. It does respect it as it is. The other one doesn't respect it. I, I still I don't understand in my head how it is the same thing, but they told me at the end you end up studying the same kind of objects. Here we consider that 
equivalence of not work as in the classical case, and the weights are just numbers attached to them, and they don't mean anything more than that. Okay. I think the other, the numbers mean actually something in the real space. I'm not, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry. Very well. Yeah. It looks like your links are oriented, right? I don't take oriented uh, here. But for, for the break, you can the right? you, you can add orientation if you want. It's an extra thing, an extra factor to consider. Here I don't take oriented, but uh, you could add orientation uh, if you wanted, and then consider that they are not the same. I'm talking about not oriented. From a break, you automatically get an orientation. If you construct your link from a break, it's automatically get the orientation, and your transformations preserve the orientation. So, okay, so, okay. so we need. I'm sorry. It's possible that we need orientation. Yes, it looks like we need orientation. Okay, so. The home plate polynomial is in any huh? variant of oriented. The home plate polynomial is in any variant of oriented. Yes. Yeah, it's also as. Is it an extra thing, no? Like, we don't... Uh, so this, this theorem of Markov is an environment of oriented. Yeah, it's all, like, it, yeah, okay, it's, yeah. it's an extra yeah. more thing, like, to even distinguish the orientation. Yeah, it does. Uh, but, like, here I'm, like, that, that's a bit less than what I'm saying with that orientation. But uh, I'm, I'm now trying to see if the, the one I'm going to talk about further will see the orientation. Uh, probably it will because it's just generalized what we have. I know that the whole disease orientation in just okay. it's just that we never use it for what we do so I uh, sorry Okay, it doesn't do anything. Just wait a second, right? Cycling. Yes. Yes. <coughs> I, anyway, I think you better answer than me that question. Even though I still, I cannot say for the next step, for the things that we did, that it does, I, I guess it will see orientation in the same way. Uh, so, to continue uh, this thing, is just that I consider, for example, in these examples, uh, the thing I said about the example, uh, the thing I said about that we want also the framings to correspond, is that in the first case, if we take A to be equal to 1 and B to be equal to 1, or we take A to be equal to 2 and B to be equal to 0, we don't care. So these things will be equivalent because at the end we get the unknown with framing two. And otherwise, uh, but for example, in the second case, it does matter. So if we take A to be equal to B to be equal to one, it's different from taking A to be equal to two and B to be equal to zero. You get two different uh, frame not in it. So we consider that these things are not equivalent. Uh, then, Alexander's theorem, that is the fact that every frame not or link arises from a frame break, uh, it's obvious because you just say, well, you see your link, you find the corresponding break, and then you just attach weights so that things will match up. And then Markov's theorem, the fact that actually equivalence of frame rates means, uh, uh, of frame knots, is the same as saying that frame breaks are equivalent uh, through uh, conjugation and the Markov's move. And uh, the only difference is now, for example, in the conjugation, you can conjugate with TIs, which you didn't have before. Okay. That's the extra thing. What about your D equals 3? You can touch the relationship. Hmm? D equals 3, don't you get an extra relationship? Sorry, for D equals 3, it's just that my powers of the TIs can be 0, 1, and 2. The D is just the, uh, it just tell me what kinds of framings I can take. I didn't say anything about N. And the Yokonuma Heki algebra, which as I said in the beginning, <coughs> was introduced in the 60s by Yokonuma, now shows up as the most obvious thing to actually define 
if you want to uh, work with framed nodes. Uh, so you take, um, you have n minus 1 generators, again, that correspond to the sigma i's, same braid relations as before. The ti's, which are, I use the same notation because they are actually, again, generators of cyclic groups of order d, so they uh, commute with each other, they are of order d, they also, whenever they pass through a gi, they have the same behavior that they did before with the sigma i. And now we have this quadratic relation, which is similar to the ivahori hecke algebra relation, only now the gi is multiplied by this very stupid eigenpotent, uh, which I write down here. <coughs> so in the quadratic relation for the gi's, the ti's intervene. Again, we see that this is a quotient of the group algebra of the frame break group uh, by the quadratic relation. Uh, for q equals 1, we, um, what we take is that the gy square is equal to 1, and what we get is actually the group algebra of the complex reflection group gd1n, which is simply the rate product of the cyclic group of order d with the symmetric group. For d equals 1, we no longer have ti's, so we get back our Hecke algebra, we have a Hori Hecke algebra. Now for d different, uh, the one, uh, the ivahori hecke algebra is simply a quotient of the Yohannuma hecke algebra. You just send all the PIs to one and you recover your uh, nice quadratic relation you had before. Now, uh, so before you go to this slide, can you go back? So, uh, is the dimension of this guy what may be naively expected from this relationship? It, it will be, the dimension of this guy is the rank of the group. As it happens for the ivahori hecke algebra, which is n factorial, it is d to the n times n factorial. Um, and we do have a standard basis, which is very similar to the Hecke algebra basis, but I'm not mentioning, I'm, try, uh, I, I'm trying not to give too much information. Uh, so again, we have a Markov trace. On the Yokonoma Hecke algebra to the ring R, this is was by Kuyumaya, uh, which depends, it's defined uniquely, depends on a parameter z, which corresponds to the z of the Apneano trace. And now we need some extra parameters for the ti's. Actually, it is that uh, this x size is the trace of ti to the k, is actually this xk. So you need some, we introduce some extra parameters, which could be these numbers. Um, so and then we repeat. Hmm? Yeah, you can do it, like just to define the trace. You can do whatever you want. You can just put any parameters you want. Again, the same thing. The elements <coughs> of the frame break group they are inside their algebra. We can always we can take the quotient and obtain the Yokonoma Hecke algebra, sending the sigma i's to the gi's, the ti's to themselves. Then the trace, then we do have the first condition that a not invariant should satisfy. And we don't have the second one, so we want to normalize the trace, multiply the trace with the coefficient so that the second condition will be satisfied. Uh, and this doesn't happen, unfortunately, for every value of xi. So we cannot say for every trace we can do this normalization. We need that the xi satisfy some conditions, like we have to solve a system of equations. If uh, this condition is satisfied, it's called the condition, then we obtain an invariant for frame knots and links, which is the Kuyumaya Lambrocool invariant. And, but what is a frame knot? A frame knot is just a classical knot with weights attached to it. So if we take all these weights equal to zero, or we forget the weights, we get back a classical <coughs> knot or link. Or just think that the BN is inside the rate product. So if we forget the braids, we do obtain an invariant for classical knots and links. And um, the question that the reason like I started looking at this object was like whether there is an algebraic reason why um, the two invariants we obtain, like the conflict and this invariance, could be compared, or like they are the same or not. Um, and 
the answer I have to give, like it's been just a couple of years of work, for the moment is first that it's not obvious. Like many people would say, but yeah, yeah, it's almost similar, so it should be the same, but at least we haven't found, maybe it's obvious for somebody else, but for us it's not very obvious that we obtain the same invariant. Anything obvious, we try to fail. We managed to show very easily that if the trace of the EI is equal to 1, you, this negates the effect that the EI have in the quadratic relation, and you end up obtaining the same thing as in the classical case, so we do obtain the conflict. And in a very recent work, not yet published, like a couple of months old, we managed to show that when we're working only on knots, like only on one component, not links, these invariants uh, are the same. You just not need to take z to be equal to zeta, that before you take zeta to be z over something. But anyway, topologically, the invariants are uh, of the same strength. So you mean there isn't renormalization somehow, it's not really an equal. Huh? So is it an equal, so you get the same thing? Yeah, you get the same thing, you just have to take different parameters okay. on each side. But it's only for knots, which is a bit surprising in the sense that we don't see how the number of components intervenes in a knot invariant so far. At least, like, that's quite uh, strange. But it was a conjecture um, that came up through computations with computer, and then we just broke it, so it just showed up. But nothing similar for um, two components, three components. Anyway, we do believe that, w I don't say here, we do believe that we don't get anything new. But uh, it's been a couple of years where we have not had much progress with showing that at least they are the same. Um, well, I'm an algebraist. I'm interested in the representation theory of uh, new algebras that come up my way. Uh, so the first thing that we knew immediately when you look at the Yokonoma Hecke algebra is that because it's a deformation of the complex reflection group GD1n, you apply its deformation theorem and you obtain a bijection of irreducible representations. So you know that the irreducibles of this algebra are parameterized by the departitions of n, a departition being a, a family of departitions whose total size is equal to n. Uh, the representation <coughs> theory had been studied uh, by TM in 2005 in the general context of unipotent Hecke algebras. So unipotent Hecke algebras are a domain rings of representations obtained as induced representation from a maximal unipotent sample <coughs> inducing a linear, any linear representation uh, from uh, a maximal unipotent sample to the whole uh, Chevalet group. So, the Yokonuma Hecke algebra is just a particular case, but his results are quite theoretical for uh, our minds, and we wanted to like to actually formulas and things to work with, and we uh, tried with Pulana the same more combinatorial approach. So we have now very explicit combinatorial formulas and character formulas we can work with plus some extra stuff. And um, I have been and a reason I was interested like I go back and forth in these algebras was also because I've been working with Hecke algebras associated to complex reflection groups. So this could be seen as a Hecke algebra associated to GD1n. However, the famous Hecke algebra of GD1n is actually the Ariki koike algebra and not this one. So we were trying a bit to compare advantages and disadvantages of looking on each algebra as the formations of the group algebra of the complex reflection group. So these algebras are quite different. Um, the Yokonuma Hecke algebra respects the read product structure of GD1n. So you do have this read product relation. But it has a very bad quadratic relation for the GX. On the other hand, the Ariki Koike algebra has a very nice quadratic relation. It keeps the same one as the Ibahori Hecke algebra, but no more read product structure. If you try to do both at the same time, then it doesn't work. All the TIs become equal to each other. You no longer have a deformation of GD1n. So you cannot have both positive things. You choose one and you go with it. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that the underlying brain group is different in each case. So Hecke algebras of complex reflection groups are defined as quotients of the braid group algebras. And in the case of GD1n, this is the brain group of type B which is uh, connected to invariants for knots in the solid torus. I'm going to talk about it in a bit. 
So in our case, we saw that we only see the break group of type A. It's just that we attach some extra weight. Uh, and even though in the arithmetic Holke algebra, the Vahorhecke algebra is obviously a subalgebra because of the nice quadratic relation, we see immediately where the Vahorhecke algebra is inside the arithmetic Kolke algebra. There are much more, uh, many things in common between the representation theory of the Yokonuma Hecke algebra and the one of the Hecke algebra of type A, even though we don't find it inside, so we cannot make the trace pass directly to it. So, and in a very recent paper, like I just received two days ago, um, like uh, Poulanda de C with Nicolas Jacon, they managed to prove a connection between um, an isomorphism between the Yokonuma Hecke algebra and direct sum of matrix algebras over product. So they found the connection that could explain these similarities with the representation theory. Um, I'm sorry. Do they work for uh, Q generic or? Uh, I'm sorry. Do they work for uh, Q generic or, or any? Uh, for Q generic. I've not even, like, they sent to me two days ago. But uh, it is, it follows from your idea was that maybe there is a Morita equivalence that explains that. Mm -hmm. And when they try to prove the Morita equivalence, actually they end up that it's an isomorphism. So uh, there is an isomorphism on direct sum matrix algebras over tensor products of Hecke algebra which explains the sure element formulas. Your uh, algebra is semi-simple, right? Hmm? Your algebra For Q-generic, yes. For Q-generic. Maybe it is also, I really have not had time to look on the details to see if it's uh, also for any Q. Um, <coughs> so, with, uh, because we had these two algebras, the Ariki Koike and the Yokonoma Heke, we went one level up, and we found an algebra which combines all these elements, and we call this the cyclotomic Yokonuma Hecke algebra. The way you go up is the same way that you go up from the uh, Ivahori Hecke to Ariki Koike. So, by the way, we added some relations, and now this algebra, Y D M N, has as a quotient both Yokonuma Hecke and both Ariki Koike algebra. <laughs> uh, and for n equals 1, you get the one, and for d equals 1, you get the other. Um, we study this algebra uh, and we define a Markov trace on it. So a Markov trace on the Ariki Koike algebra is used to obtain invariance for knots in the solid torus. So if you repeat the same procedure in the case of YDM, you get invariance for not for frame knots in the solid torus. And then if you forget the framings, you obtain um, invariance for knots in the solid torus. But again, the question arises, is it the same? Is it different from the one we had? It's exactly the same question that we have in the classical case. So we can repeat, like, I think that if we answer the first one, it will be the same answer to this one. Marie, yeah. One more question. When you say mark of trace, is it just the linear function of the organization? It's a linear, yeah, it's a linear function with? For the organization, either quotient. I, I, I don't get the word. Okay. It's, it, it's just a linear map which satisfies um, trace of A, B times trace B, A, and it also has the extra condition that if you multiply the, the generic of GI gives the parameter Z out. So it's uh, something like one or two extra conditions. Um, okay, so now I have a bit less time than I thought. Anyway, I, I'm just I'm just talking about things we're working on right now. So, topologies are also looking into temporary algebras uh, because this was like the initial Jones invariant was not obtained through the Eva Horihecki algebra, but through the temporary algebra, which is a quotient of uh, the Hecke algebra by an ideal generated by this element. This element you can recognize as being like the sum of all the generators of the group algebra of S3. Uh, so this is a, defi a definition of the temporary leap algebra. Uh, and the Ogneano trace we saw in the beginning can pass through the quotient if you take zeta to have a very specific value. So using the temporary leap algebra, you obtain the Jones polynomial, which is an invariant depending only on one parameter q. So that's the one variable Jones polynomial that you get through that. Historically, that preceded the two variable one. 
Um, you have that the irreducible representations of this algebra are very easy to uh, determine. So uh, you have that um, the irreducibles of the Hecke are parameterized by the partitions of n. So you just want to see which ones uh, pass to the quotient. So which ones take the value 0 on the generator of the ideal. And uh, so what you want at the end, like it's very easy to compute. So what you want at the end is when you restrict from Sn to S3, you want your representation uh, not having the trivial representation in the restriction. And the trivial representation corresponds to three boxes, the one next to each other. So it's very easy to see that because the restriction from <coughs> Sn to S3 is just removing boxes, it's easy to, to uh, determine that the irreducible representations of the temporal lib are parameterized by partitions whose young diagrams have at most two columns. So you never end up with something with three boxes in a row. Anyway, and um, you have a basis which is easily extracted from the standard basis of the Vahoy Hecke algebra, but also there is a diagrammatic basis of the temporal lib algebra with diagrams that are not like the braid diagrams we saw before, but it's like a completely um, an independent definition, independent from the ivahori hecke algebra with its own diagram. <coughs> so the first thing that um, these four people did was they wanted to obtain uh, a, an equivalent of the temporal lib algebra in the case of the yokohama hecke So first approach was let's divide with the same idea. So what happened was like, we said, okay, we're gonna look at the representations and we found that they are parameterized that are the multipartitions whose young diagrams have in total two columns. So we said, well, that looks nice. That looks like a nice generalization of the temporary algebra. Uh, here, it was not that easy because now we had to restrict from GD1N to SN uh, to S3. Again, you didn't want this three boxes in a row appearing, but now we have to deal with little with Richardson coefficients, and not many things are known for them. We have to say it was not difficult, but it was not as obvious as in the temporal lib algebra case. We managed to extract a basis with a lot of difficulty, so this is not, well, not a very beautiful basis. And after we did all that, and we thought that we were done, they checked for which values the Markov Tracy passed through to the quotient, and they found that the only values is when the trace of the EI is equal to 1, which is the case that we had already seen, that we don't get anything different from the home flip. So they said, well, this is not very useful to us. So I'm sorry, now I spent a couple of minutes saying something that we've discarded, but well, remember the Tower of Pisa. You never know how what? it will look. What do you mean by all lambda i together have the most so you have, uh, like, you count all the columns in total. You have, like, the first partition could have one column, the second two. Like, this is okay. So this is okay. This is not okay. So these are three columns in total. These are two. So you count them all together. And then we find maybe what's the best candidate, which is the formalization. It looks more artificial than the previous <coughs> one, but it makes sense to um, take the ideal to be a bit smaller, uh, sorry, a bit bigger, and uh, you take, you, we multiply the generator of the previous ideal with the, the potents E1 and E2, and now things are working much smooth, uh, in a much smoother way. Uh, so the irreducibles now are parameterized by the partitions such that each diagram has at most two columns. And actually that was very easy. It's a very easy thing to do because this nice like, dependency uh, E1, E2 makes us restrict to each partition and then we apply the classical result case, something that we couldn't do in the previous one. Oh, and uh, no, they are not a um, And uh, constructing a basis is uh, a work in progress. Like we do believe that in this case we have a very nice diagrammatic base, maybe equivalent to the temporary leap, but we have not had much time or luck with it. So if anyone wants to work with this, they are uh, will be happy. 
to have you help us with this thing. So I was, I, I have an extra slide, okay, which is now I'm talking about everything we do in this past year, uh, where I'm going to talk to you, like last slide, promise, about the affine Yokonuma Heike algebra. So remember, here I get the cyclotomic Yokonuma Heike algebra going one level up, but there is one level further up is by taking m to be equal to infinity. So in the Ariki Kolke algebra case, like the Ariki Kolke algebras have one relation of that form, a product like that, like one extra generator, x1. This extra generator exists also in our cyclotomic Kyokonuma Heke algebra. If you remove this relation from the Ariki Koki algebra, you obtain the affine Heke algebra of type A. If you remove this relation from our cyclotomic Yokonuma Heke algebra, we obtain the affine Yokonuma Heke algebra of type A. So, this affinization in what we did was quite natural because we actually bumped into the affine Yokonuma Heke algebra when we were studying the representations of the Yokonuma Heke algebra. So there is an approach in studying the representation theory of the Vahori Heke algebra by using the affine. And what we did was the same in the case of the Yokonuma Heke. So in our first paper, we <coughs> defined a version of this algebra that we formalized in our second paper. But as I mentioned in the introduction of my talk, the Vahori Heke algebra um, can be generalized to the Yokonuma Heke algebra uh, by taking the Edom, like instead of taking, by the original definition, instead of taking the Borel subgroup and inducing the trivial representation to the Chevalet group, you replace the Borel by a maximal unipotent subgroup. So it seems that this works also here. So the affine Heck algebra has a similar construction when instead of working over a finite field, like if you take GLN, instead of taking it over a finite field, you take it over the periodic numbers. Then, if you take the endomorphism ring of the permutation representation with respect to an Ivahori sub, which is the equivalent of the Borel, you take the affine Heck algebra of type A. If now you replace the Ivahori subgroup by what we call the proper <coughs> Ivahori subgroup, which is the equivalent of a maximal unipotent, it ends, like we saw uh, very recently with the Russian show, that what we obtain is the affine Yokonuma Heke algebra. So this definition, replace the Ivahori subgroup by proper Ivahori subgroup, was used by Vigneras in several preemptories of her to define what she calls a proper Ivahori Heke algebra. So, the small anecdote about this was like, okay, we had defined with like, the affine Yokonuma Heike algebra. So when Van Sassoshar told us, you know, this could be the same algebra that Vigneras was defined, we were very excited because like, yeah, we did something that also shows up in somebody else's work. It's not just so self-included. It has some sense for the periodic numbers. So we proved that these things are isomorphic. And then Seychelles went to Vigneras and he told her that, uh, well, we proved this connection too. And she was like, oh, I'm so happy you found some application because like, I thought that what I did didn't have any connection with anything else. So now we are all happy. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? So you said that in uh, some, particular, some particular cases, a trace of E is equal to 1. Yes. But E depends only on D, right? It depends only on the size. Actually, it, um, because, um, I'm sorry, I will, the EI is a very important like that. TI to the S, TI plus 1 to the minus S. So the trace of the EI only makes appear big size. So then you have to have a solution. So that because we want this E condition to be satisfied to obtain an invariant, you solve a system of equation. Some of the solutions do give you trace of E i equals to 1, but then there are other solutions that don't. The trace of the E i is always a number of the form 1 over an integer, where integer is from uh, 1 to t minus 1. 
But you know that there are solutions that give you each possible case. The solutions are actually parameterized by the subject of the study group. Any further questions? Okay. If not, I 